we're super excited about this conversation. We know it's very timely. So Cassandra Frisrik is the executive director of the Drug Policy Alliance. As I said, it's a national nonprofit that works to end the war on drugs and build alternatives grounded in science, compassion, and human rights. Among other victories, Cassandra was the architect of the campaign that cut the number of New York City marijuana arrests by more than 99% since 2010, which is huge. Um, she has been featured in New York Times, NSNBC, USA Today, NPR, and the Netflix documentary, Grass is Greener. And she was also recognized in Essence Magazine's Wolf 100 and The Roots Root 100. Thank you so much for being here with us today, Cassandra. Thank you. And we also have Danielle Sered, um, Executive Director of Common Justice. She envisioned and she now directs Common Justice. And Common Justice develops practical and groundbreaking solutions to violence that advances racial equity and really meets the needs of those harmed and does not rely on incarceration. Before planning the launch of Common Justice, Danielle serves as the, served as the Deputy Director of the Vera Institutes of Justice's Adolescent Reentry Initiative, a program from, for young men returning from incarceration from Rikers Island. Danielle is the author of The Other Side of Harm, Addressing Disparities in Our Responses to Violence, Accounting for Violence, How to Increase Safety and Break Our Felt Reliance on Mass Incarceration, in the book, Until We Reckon, Violence, Mass Incarceration, and the Road to Repair. So thank you so much for being here with us, Danielle. And I'm turning over to both of you. Thank you, Kara. So we're so excited for so many people to be joining us today about this um, great conversation. Um, Danielle and I joke that this is having our text message conversations in public. Um, and so we apologize if we get in the weeds. That's the first drug pun of the evening. Um, so um, we're going to go back and forth and have this really uh, interesting conversation about uh, what it's going to take to end mass incarceration and uh, the conversations that we're, you know, as drug policy um, movement are not having um, and how that impedes our goal to end the drug war and also to do our part to end mass incarceration. Um, and, you know, when Danielle and I talked about this um, conversation, she said, you should start off with all the things that y'all have won so far to kind of give a backdrop as to, um, you know, how we're having these conversations together. And so, you know, I think as everyone has seen in November, you couldn't pick up a piece of news without the joke being that drugs won election 2020, you know, from Oregon decriminalizing um, drug possession in, uh, in, in their state and, you know, moving money from marijuana revenue into creating access to treatment to the five states that legalize um, cannabis to, a state like Mississippi passing medical cannabis um, to where we were two weeks ago where the House of Representatives in the US Congress passed the first federal marijuana descheduling bill. Drug policy has been on a winning streak for the last couple of years. And in 2020, we have moved so much even in amidst a pandemic and a hostile federal government. Um, and yet when oftentimes when people ask me um, wh what do you feel? What do you think? You know, I often say that, you know, being a part of the drug policy movement is winning and losing at the same time. And oftentimes people are like, well, well you legalize cannabis or you decriminalize drugs in Oregon or you passed Rockefeller drug laws or you got people access to methadone and buprenorphine. People are talking about your issue. It's in Hollywood. Jay-Z's in the business. John Legend's in the business. People are talking about these over and over again. And what I would say is that um, I, I often think it's important for us to contextualize what did we have to give up to make the win? And a strong critique, a strong valid critique of the drug policy reform movement has been 
the overpromise that ending the drug war would end mass incarceration. It's been the narrative choices um, that have focused reforms on nonviolent drug offenders, that's the language, and the silence often of mainstream drug policy groups like Drug Policy Alliance on the issue of people who sell drugs and violence. And often this idea that the, the only harm we talk about consistently is the harm that the state does um, to people, which is very real. But there's also other kinds of harm. Um, and I think about um, the harm that some of the people that I've organized with, like Alexis Pluse um, in upstate New York, who, who works with parents that are navigating their very real their very real hurt around struggling with young people and addiction um, and navigating how to be a parent when someone is in chaotic use. Um, I think about uh, the harm that I've met with kids who had um, parents who were struggling with drug addiction, who often get frustrated in the conversations I have with people where they're like, yeah, I get it, but like my childhood sucked, right? Um, and so I think we're at this moment where we've won so much that we don't have to continue to win in the same way. And we can do more work um, so that we don't have to lose so big. Um, because I think those losses are really chipping away at the world that we can build together. And so I, you know, this, I did not get here by myself. This thinking is not something I came into. Um, I think about folks um, in the formerly incarcerated people's movement, like Daryl Atkinson and Dorsey Nunn um, and Vivian Nixon and Susan Burton, who have all pushed DPA at different moments about our conversations and our narratives around violence and people who sell drugs. And one of the people that had such a stark experience in my life that I hold very dear is when I went to visit Danielle Sered for the first time and she <laughs> opened it up by telling me how much and how often drug policy reformers uh, threw um, people under the bus and how we had to get our shit together. And so this is an exciting moment for me to have this conversation out loud with you, Danielle. Um, and, you know, we'll just pass it over to you right now. <laughs> thank you, Cassandra. And thank you for kicking us off. Congratulations on all of those wins, because however much we know that there are limitations tied to them, we also know that they are profound um, for our shared movement. Um, and I know I joined just so many people who are here today and just celebrating your leadership in this movement and now of the Drug Policy Alliance. So um, massive congratulations to DPA on an excellent choice and executive director. Um, I think one of the things that, um, that brings this conversation really central for us is that we know it really is for folks who care about ending the drug war, but also care about ending mass incarceration. And we know that we will not end mass incarceration unless we deal with the question of violence. And part of that is because more than half of people locked up in the US are locked up for crimes of violence. And so that means that if we ignore them, we are guaranteed to shrink the success that we can otherwise achieve. We are guaranteed to never achieve even a level of incarceration that would put us on par with, for example, any other similarly situated country in the world mm -hmm. or in all of human history, let mm -hmm. alone the sort of visionary reductions that are otherwise available. But I think it's deeper than that. I think so much of why we do incarceration instead of schools, incarceration instead of roads, incarceration instead of, for example, a public health infrastructure that could handle a pandemic to pick a random one is because of the stories that were told about fear or about who causes harm about the ends to which people should have to go um, in order to be protected, about um, what that form of protection should look like. And those stories are old, those stories are racist, those stories are de definitive of who we are as a people. And they show up in the undercurrent in all of our reform efforts, unless we get to the root and really commit um, to 
to eliminating them from our shared story. And I think, you know, I'm not actually great at growing houseplants, but I do know <laughs> from people who are great at it, that trimming the edges is often a part of how you help something grow. Like mm -hmm. if you want to not see anything ever again, you come for it at the roots. And I believe the roots of mass incarceration are in racism mm -hmm. and in an intertwined space where that racism is weaponized, is activated through stories of violence. And so I know our experience at Common Justice as people who work on the issue of violence, who divert people who've committed violence um, from prison into a community-based alternative to incarceration is that we found at the beginning a lot of the narrative barriers we were coming up against were not from our opposition per se. Mm -hmm. Like they were from the people who were standing at our side in the movement fighting mm -hmm. for nonviolent crimes, mm -hmm. you know, fighting for drug reform, fighting for things related to theft and other nonviolent mm -hmm. crimes. And that the narrative that we had constructed is not the narrative that our enemies handed us, which is a sort of totalizing narrative that mm -hmm. throws all of us under the bus. Um, the narrative that drove this division down the middle of our movement is one that we created. And I think that that means that we have a, a shared responsibility for it. But the good news about it is that if it is ours to create, I think it is also ours to unmake. And so I think one of the things that is so promising to me about this moment is that um, like we're at a, a moment of rupture in our nation. Mm -hmm. Right, we're in a moment of like truth breaking open, of stories breaking open, of history breaking open, like all of these things. And it means like we don't have to settle for not just incremental changes in the reforms we win, but incremental changes in the stories we tell. I think it's a moment we're like called on to tell more whole truths and that those whole truths will like bring people along who have not been brought along before. Um, and that we'll win when we do that. And I'm really, you know, I'm so interested in what you see from where you stand about like what, what you see as com becoming possible, you know, like what mm -hmm. becomes possible if we do that? Like, you know, what do we lose? Cause I think mm -hmm. it's important that we're honest about what we lose and we not pretend that this is just like, has always been the secret winning strategy. We just <laughs> happen not to deploy. Um, but like, you know, what do we lose and what do we win and how, and like, do you see that as different now? Like, is it just that we finally are coming to a point of collective realization and reckoning that this strategy has long been a disservice to us? Um, or is there like a change in the circumstance that means that strategies are available to us that weren't before and like it's our job not to miss them? What does it look like from where you stand? I think, so I appreciate everything that you just said and what I would, offer is that from from our vantage point um i think we're in this incredible moment of like political education um covid has created the conditions to which the people are able to think more in community um and that this idea of abolition is a lot more tangible and it feels so much more realistic um, and it's less lofty, right? It's not something that can happen. No one, I think abolitionists have always felt like, uh, you know, this can happen right now, right? But I think that there have been people who are new to it, who are like, this doesn't have to take a hundred years. Like there are decisions we can make at this moment um, that can change the sphere. And I think the other thing that has been helpful for me is that I think that people are ready to let go of this scarcity mind, um, mindset, that, that um, we can only get one thing. I think more people in the space are realizing that even if we ask for one thing, they're going to make us half that slice. Like that the status quo is actually always set up for us to negotiate against ourselves. And so that this moment is really about asking for what we want. And so for me, Drug Policy Alliance, our want is to end the drug war. You know, and this conversation about violence is self-serving, right? Like there are people in our movement who want to end the drug war, but don't necessarily think they want to end mass incarceration, right? 
Um, and that's very true. And my whole big thing is like, you can get on the train and get off whatever stop you want to get off on. You just can't derail the rest of the train for everybody else. Right. And so I think for us, what is possible is this idea like where we get to say in our movement, if we want to end the drug war wholesale, we won't do that unless we have a wholesale conversation about violence. So we actually cannot hold our nose when people start talking about harm and people who commit harm because we we're not divorced from that movement. You know, oftentimes people talk about drug policy and, and, and drug laws and they say it's a victimless crime. And that is not inherently true at all. There are so many people that are harmed by the drug war. We have parents who harm by the drug war, kids who harm by the drug war, communities harmed by the drug war. Um, that harm looks different. It has varying different degrees. But what I'm seeing is what I'm seeing is possible is this abundance mindset where it's like we want to end the harm associated with the drug war, which means we have to open up the conversation about what the drug war is. Because I think to your point, We've told stories about our own movement that are inaccurate, that are not true, that are limiting, that make it difficult for us to actually get the win. And I think we're at this moment right now, which is like those stories don't serve us. Um, and if they don't serve us, then let's figure out what actually will get us to the thing that we want. You know, I think about the MORE Act um, where we got so much, right? But then there were some really hard things that came out of it where they were just like, People with, um, you know, nonviolent people were only the only people that were able to get certain um, relief, that people with criminal justice histories couldn't be a part of the industry, all these different things. And the, you know, the opposition didn't give us those talking points. Those were the talking points we've been hawking for 20 years. And so even though we didn't say it, it didn't mean that it wasn't in the room. And so I think that from what I'm, what what I am, from where I'm standing, I think we're in this moment of we need a deep spring cleaning in our movement and we need to sage the space so we can start again. And that's, it is daunting. Um, it means that we're going to mess up and we're going to say the wrong things and we're going to have to be called in and called out and, you know, we might have to change priorities, but um, it's absolutely necessary for us to get the thing that we want. I think it's so, it's so powerful to hear and it's so promising. And it's like, I think one of the things that I find like you and I hear this a lot and people get stuck on a lot is like, well, certain things are winnable now and other things are not winnable now. Mm -hmm. Right. And of course that's true. You know, mm -hmm. again, it's, and I think there are times where like the things we win are the best that could have been won. Right. right. Like, it's just the truth. Like we got the maximum that was available. Like that's mm -hmm. what happened. Um, and I think people should continue to get the maximum of what's available, even when it doesn't reach people charged with violence. Like I really, as somebody whose work is exclusively with people charged with violence, I'm like every person who gets free, like their freedom is sacred. Their connection to their family is sacred when they return to their communities, it begins to mend the rip and the fabric of that community that was broken open when they were taken from it. Like every single person who gets free, it matters. Like, mm -hmm. and I think we have to hold that deeply because if we don't believe that, then we can throw all sorts of people away. Right? Right. If we understand the sacredness of every person's freedom, then it means those smaller wins, those incremental wins, those limited wins, they also matter. They're also sacred. And for me, I think the thing I get frustrated with is that we, is I think we make two mistakes. Like one is that we don't do an accurate assessment of our political capital, right? Like we assume mm -hmm. we have less than yes. we have. We assume mm -hmm. that something costs more than it does. Mm -hmm. um, and so we don't try for it. So like we're sitting there with a hundred dollars in our wallet looking for something that's 1999 because we didn't right. peek behind that 120 to find there were four more. And so we don't estimate our political capital adequate, like accurately mm -hmm. and often underestimate what we can win. And related to that, we don't do enough base building work that would build our political capital that's and our right. political power so that we could afford something that did cost more. So even yeah. when we're right, we're like, that thing is a $99 one, not a $19 one. We don't ask the question of like, what would it take us to have that adequate capital 
mm-hmm. to win that. Like we Definitely. say, how much do we have? How much does it cost? And we look for the sort of best match. And I think that's a mistake that comes from being excessively focused on policy and insufficiently focused on organizing and building power. That's right is that when we're excessively focused on policy, it keeps our eye on like what's currently within reach. Um, And it too often takes our eye off the question of power. Um, And when we put our eye on the question of power, then we start to ask things like, who else can we bring to the table, right? Like how do we broaden this table? How do we broaden this base? And when we do that, to your point, some of what we find is the narratives that we have been using to get our 1999 are actually exactly the narratives that exclude the people who would come along with us That's right. for the more expensive, costlier win. Because the thing that we would be fighting for when it is more expansive, it is inherently therefore connected to yeah. more people's pain, to more people's mm-hmm. experience, to more people's needs. It means the mother in that house whose child is using and whose other child is upstate on gun possession and whose third child is in the street. And every night when she comes home, she like says a prayer and breathes a sigh of relief because she didn't lose him to it. Like she has a stake then in all of it in ways she might not prioritize your meeting if it's just for the one son who smoked weed. And so I think there is a way in which like we really, um, we overestimate the cost of expansive reforms we underestimate um, our capacity to build greater power. And then related to that, I think um, we confuse policy compromises and narrative Mm -hmm. compromises. And you know, this is my obsession. Like Mm -hmm. we assume that because something is not currently winnable, that that means like, it's like all bets are off, right? It's like, if you can't win the ideal policy, like, bucket, like say whatever you got to say. And I think those are actually different decisions, right? I think there is a really clear judgment you make of like, you're doing a a mechanical assessment, right? You're doing an assessment that is about what is actually available in that moment, in that particular legislative session. You're asking the question is like, does winning this cause other harm? And if Mm -hmm. not, like you're winning it and you're, it's less than you wanted to win and it has carve outs and has imperfections and it has limitations, but it will get people free. But I think we think because we have to do that, it means somehow that all the narrative compromises we're used to making go with it. That we say, you know, do this for juveniles because unlike adults, they're capable of change make this policy for adjustment for people committed over nonviolent crimes because they're not the real monsters, right? Like mm-hmm. all of those mm-hmm. things we say, in the, like last half of those sentences about who the people we're fighting for aren't, mm-hmm. we don't have to say that. Yeah. Like we could just stop. We could yeah. be like, do this because the kids, like, do this because kids can change. Yeah. Like do yeah. this because is the wrong place for someone who is suffering from addiction. And you don't have to say, but it's the right place for this other guy, That's- right? Like we don't have to continually win through comparison. And I think that habit that we assume is necessary to win just isn't necessary to win. And I think, and I'll stop talking and pass it to you because I think in, I think the best example I can think of, of a campaign in the drug policy realm that didn't go anywhere within a hundred miles of the question of violence, but still threw no one under the bus and actually did the sort of work of building collective power of advancing a narrative that ultimately would serve to win for violence is the campaign you ran around marijuana arrests in New York. Mm -hmm. Um, Like all the time, I think about that as one that, that elevated everybody that advanced the collective that advanced our work, even though it stood a hundred thousand miles from it in terms of like where you'd look it up in the penal code. Um, And that campaign, I think exemplifies a way that we can win things that are, um, that do not necessarily even get as far as violence, but also don't cause the kind of harm or division that these campaigns normally do. Yeah. You know, I, I'm i always so struck when you bring that campaign up um, that we ran in partnership with um, groups like Vocal and Communities United for Police Reform. Um, at, at the time, you know, I was at um, DPA and um, Gabriel Osea, who runs the Katal Center, um, was directing the New York campaign, I mean, the New York uh, office. And we were like, we were at this moment where we were having this conversation about um, marijuana arrests and stop and frisk. 
And I think one of the things that was really humbling about that was that as we were building that campaign, we were doing one-on-ones with social justice groups across the city, right? And we were asking them about marijuana arrests. How is this showing up in your in your community, with your members, in your family? And we did hundreds of one-on-ones, um, just downright organizing, going to groups, going to people, having conversations. And what everyone told us, despite the fact that New York was the marijuana arrest capital in New York, right? was that it wasn't about marijuana for people. And that's really shocking for us, right? As like DPA, cause we're like, our whole thing is drugs. Like, what do you mean? Like we're putting all this time to deal with this drug thing, this really narrow drug thing. And y'all are telling us it's not about that. Like, how are we supposed to pitch this? And I think one of the, the things about the marijuana less campaign was that It was about marijuana and it wasn't about it. It was about all the ways that they were using marijuana to disrupt our communities, to kick people out of their housing, to deport people, to get people um, to lose custody of their kids, to violate people um, on parole or probation. For us, it became clear that marijuana was a vehicle to have a larger conversation about state sanctioned violence. And that's how we built this, the campaign, which was about like, let's talk about the violence that is happening to our community, the harm that is happening to our community and use marijuana as a praxis. But at the end of the day, we had elected officials who were very nervous about talking about marijuana, who were very okay with talking about the state sanctioned violence that was happening in their communities. And later on, they got more comfortable with violence um, and we, later on, they got more comfortable with marijuana, but it was the process in ch- talking about the shared experience that we were all having that got us to this place, um, which helped us to have a bigger conversation, right? And that to me has been so instrumental in the way that I think about drug policy, because, you know, when I think about, you know, I often, um, when people in the broader criminal legal justice movement are like, you guys are throwing us under the bus. I'm like, let, let, me, let me be very clear. We're throwing each other under the bus in our movement, in the drug policy movement. We're losing outside. We're throwing people outside out. And we're throwing people outside in our own movement under the bus because the narratives that we have built, that we have gotten important wins on, have made it seem like we couldn't get something else. And because sometimes when you are fighting for an ending of something and don't have an affirmative vision, it, it, it shortens what you see as, it shortens what you can see. And then it creates a ton of false choices that you feel like you have to make. So even for us in our movement, we're now having to undo the choices that we've made between people who use drugs versus people who sell drugs. We're having to undo the choices we've made around weed versus heroin. Like we're like we're making different choices around providing people safer syringe access or giving people safer smoking pits. And so it's like we're recognizing in this moment that to end mass incarceration, we also have to deal with the folks that have committed harm who also were selling drugs that we are not separate and a part of the movement and that our campaigns and our narrative work has to be in conjunction and community towards an affirmative vision that includes people that commit harm. And and also that our solutions and our interventions have to deal with the harm that is happening within our movement space. Um, and And I think that's only possible now because I think it's more possible now because more people are having the conversation about what is the affirmative vision because we've done things like legalize marijuana where we didn't necessarily have an affirmative vision and now we're dealing with the harms of capitalism, which is doing real harm and it's still based on the real racist tropes of who is possible to be a respectable business person um, in this legit market, which is still based on classes, sexist, racist tropes. 
So I don't think we're at this place because um, we are now enlightened. I think it goes back to what my therapist says. You ask for help when it hurts too much. Um, and I think that our movement is self-serving in like coming to this space because we realize that we're not going to stop the harm um, and that some of the harm we're navigating is self-inflicted. Um, but I don't like I don't I think it would be helpful for me to hear from you about like because you deal with violence but you also deal with a lot of like interpersonal violence and I think we've always struggled with navigating how to have that conversation. Yeah. I mean, I think what you say is so profound and I really do, I share your sense so much about the importance of the affirmative vision as how we shift this. Um, like, I think our movement has been like, you know, it's like 90% destroyers, 10% builders and that we are called on in this moment to invert the ratio. Um, and so many of us who have been in the business of tearing things down have to become in the business of building things up. Like if you look at a construction site, there's usually only one bulldozer and then there's a ton of other shit. Um, I don't know what all, all of the fancy machines are, but there's cranes, there's like five cranes for every one bulldozer, right? Like that, there's something right about that ratio, right? There's only so much of the work that is the dismantling work. And I think that's the lesson of people like Dr. Angela Davis, Dr. Ruthie Wilson Gilmore, which are that is that abolition is creation, right? Not the mm -hmm. elimination of things. And so, I think that is a place where like the affirmative visions, like the things we don't want might be different, but the affirmative vision that comes out of these two movements are likely to be similar, right? That's like right. they will be visions of communities in which people's basic needs are met. And therefore, like they don't have to cause harm. Therefore, like they can love the people in their lives and protect the people in their lives without hurting others, like where they have autonomy over their own bodies, but don't have permission to hurt someone else's body right like all of that I actually think the affirmative vision is likely to be really convergent um in ways if you were like what are two things you don't want everyone's going to answer different things and if you were like what is the world you want I think there will be a lot more alignment and so I think in steering into that affirmative vision not only do we find more alignment I think we also just find that more people will join us in it, right? Mm -hmm. Like I think of a mentor of mine growing up in Chicago who used to always say, it's hard to get people to fight for a shit sandwich easy on the shit. <laughs> um, and I think that's what we do. We're like, we want 15 years instead of 20. We want a misdemeanor instead of a felony. We want, you know, and, and 15, like 15 years is better than 20. It's five years better. A misdemeanor mm -hmm. is, can be a lifetime better than a felony in context of things like three strikes. But at the same time, and certainly like if I'm going to eat a shit sandwich, I would like the thinnest spread possible, like no <laughs> doubt. And at the same time, I'm like, what if we fought at least for like a peanut butter and jelly? Mm -hmm. But like, what if we actually dared to fight for something that would nourish us? Like mm -hmm. a whole plate of food that would nourish us. And maybe even a plate of food that would be enough to nourish us and nourish us like the people we love most. Mm -hmm. A plate of food that can nourish us, the people we love most and our neighbors, right? Like what if we start to do that instead of being like, may I please have half the shit? Mm -hmm. And the thing is, if we do that, I think not only does the thing we fight for expand, but the range of people who will throw the weight of their power, of their lives, mm -hmm. of their vision, their experience behind it, I think becomes far greater. Mm -hmm. And so I think what you say about the affirmative vision is exactly right. Like, I think that's the place of confluence is going to likely be much more about what we want than about what we don't. And, and that is similar to like, when you ask about interpersonal harm, the thing we do at Common Justice that's most transformative is that we offer people another option. Like it mm -hmm. is impossible to predict in the absence of options what people will choose in the presence of options. Mm -hmm. So when you ask a survivor, do you want prison or nothing? Some people say prison because nothing feels wrong because their pain isn't nothing because their loss isn't nothing because their needs aren't nothing. Like as survivors, I'm like, if you give a survivor a menu, they're like, I'd like an extra large, what do you have, right? Mm -hmm. Like we want the most, right? Because the pain is the most. And so the profound thing that happens in the presence of options is it reveals how few people actually like the thing that's currently on the table. So at Common Justice, we talk all the time about 90% of people who are given the choice. These are cases of stabbings, shootings, gunpoint robberies. 
they're given the choice between whether they want the person who hurt them incarcerated or want them in common justice, and 90% choose common justice. Now, more than half of victims didn't call the police in the first place. Shame mm -hmm. on us. Another mm -hmm. half don't make it past grand jury. That's 75% out. So we're starting mm -hmm. at 25%. So how dare we say that system is centered on victims? Like we mm -hmm. need to get their names all the way out of our mouths. But in that remaining quarter, those people who have signed up for a process likely to result in the incarceration of the person who hurt them, when you ask those same people, people who were hospitalized, who were rendered unconscious, who have visible scars for the rest of their lives, 90% choose common justice and they don't do it because they love innovation and they don't do it because they're criminal justice reformers and they don't do it because they want to end mass incarceration in their lifetimes. They do it because they do not want to be hurt again and they do not want someone else to be hurt again. And they know that prison can't keep that promise because if it could keep that promise, they wouldn't have been hurt in the first place. Yeah. Like we have incarcerated more people in our country than any nation in all of human history. If prison worked to be pr to produce safety, we would be the safest place ever to have existed. It fails and people know it. But what we find is that the portion of people who will fight for something different, who will choose something different, will always be greater than just the portion of people who will fight against something that exists. And so I think that that when you say like this turn toward an affirmative vision, I think you're exactly right. And I think it has implications for alignment in our movement. I think it has implications for shifts in our narrative. And I think it has implications for building power um, that are exactly the kind of things that we need in the moment of like crisis and opportunity that's before us at this time. Wow, I just, uh, okay. So thank you because what you just offered um, affirmed this this real thing for me, which is like, we already have what we need. And I think sometimes I, like, honestly, I think I come in and out of that sometimes. Like some, some days I'm like, we don't have what we need yet, right? Like, and we don't even know what that is. I think that's true. But I also think we have what we need as well, right? Like that our movements already contain that. And you know, as you were talking about survivors and, and the options and the choices, I think a lot about um, a group of people in our work, our parents, um, who are fighting against the drug war. I think about groups like Broken No More, Grass, Moms Against the Drug War, um, Truth Farm. These are people that have lost a ton. Um, they've lost their children, they've lost their loved ones, their partners. And they, in our movement, it can be really scary. It can be really scary because moms are really powerful. My mom is one of the most powerful women in my life, right? And in the world, I would offer. You all just don't know it. Um, and in our movement, oftentimes, there will be parents that like lose their kids. And in that pain and with that lack of option, they will turn to things like work with the prosecutor to find the person that gave their kid that drug to incarcerate their kid, right? And as drug policy, we can fight against that policy, but I never want to be fighting against that mom. It's just, it's unfair to the mom and it's unfair to me, right? Um, it's unfair to the mom because I don't want to be using my time, my ability to change hearts and minds to power build against the mom that has lost their kid. It's just, it's just, it's a gross, gross place um, to be in. Like I've literally been in rooms where um, I'm talking about marijuana legalization and a mom comes up to me and starts screaming at me because her kid died, maybe not from marijuana, but from something else. And, and it's like, I'm not going to be arguing facts with this woman. This woman is literally standing in front of me in the fullness of her pain, right? And I am bearing witness to that, which is sacred, which I have to take as an honored intervention. I have to navigate that because it is, it is also a painful exchange. And I think that one of the things that's so hard 
is that a lot of times those parents don't have additional options. They don't have additional narratives. They have what the state has given them, which is your child is dead because of this person. Not your child is dead because we didn't give them resources, because there was no treatment on demand, because we've closed all the treatment facilities, because we have not invested in treatment, because there's um, drug prohibition, because the world is racist, because we've learned how to profitize addiction, because we gave the pharmaceutical companies all the, the, the seance in the world to be out here and like use all the capitalist things to exploit our communities. You died because of somebody else, not because of the state, right? And I can't, when a person is showing me their pain, I'm not going to stand there and be like, well, you know, the drug boy. <laughs> like that doesn't, that is, it is, um, it doesn't rise to the scale of what is being shown to me. But those groups that I talked about earlier are moms that had, that had someone else give them a different option that 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 they were also at that crossroads and someone said the state did this that yes that person may have given your child those drugs but that person is also someone else's child and the state also created the conditions for them to be in that situation and that really we need to stop turning up on each other and turn up on the state um and i think about that because those people are like some of the people that are leading some of our movement, um, but they are also survivors of our movement. They're survivors in our movement, right? And so hearing you talk about it um, just really reaffirmed to me like how much we have a lot of the people that should be leading more um, and should be resourced more and should be leading discussions more because those parents have figured out different options in navigating harm. That is different than the policy choices or the policy interventions that I can offer, right? And I think that part of that is like, I think that's super important because policy change is not the end all be all. Policy, you know, policy will go away based on the whim of someone. And, it, and unless we change the hearts and minds by not doing the narrative compromises, our policies won't stand a chance because the state is super powerful. And I think too, Kassan, I think it's so right. And I think I would say two quick things because I see you, Kira, that it's almost time for us to go to questions. Like one is that like the mothers you are talking about, I do not believe they separate themselves from the mothers we work with who bury their children, right. who they lost to gun violence. That's right. like, and I don't believe they see themselves as fundamentally different constituencies in That's ways right. we divide that. And I think there's a deep lesson in that. And I think if you were to ask those mothers, like what would have kept your child alive and what would keep another mother from losing her child, they would know those answers and those answers would align with the affirmative vision that you were laying out. Like they would know those answers and they would fight for them the way they always fought for their children. Like I know that to be true. That's right. Thank you both. Um, such a great dynamic conversation, um, especially this last part about the mothers. It's just, it's, and it's like so hard to like figure out how to deal with those type of issues. So thanks for bringing that in, Cassandra. Um, so we have a number of questions that I wanted to go to before we close out here. So one question that was in the chat um, is for Danielle. And it says, I totally agree with what Danielle said about changing the narrative about violence being one of the most important things um, we can do. Can she provide some examples of books, dramas, podcasts, movies, et cetera, et cetera, that she thinks gets the narrative right or, um, or better than usual? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. I think, I mean, one of the things I would do is provide an example of a campaign, which is Cassandra's campaign on marijuana arrests, right? Like it's like the times we tell the stories about structures. And so I think like part of what makes it so effective is that we don't tell stories about just an individual person, like either an individual person whose pain was so much greater than all other pain or an individual person who was like so much more righteous than all other people but people who are like situated in the larger context where they live, right? And a context that has a history, like a context that reaches back across generations. Um, and so I think this is not an obvious one because it's not exactly about violence, but it is. But I think of like 
the Isabel Wilkerson's book, The Warmth of Other Suns, um, and her new book, Cast. Um, but The Warmth of Other Suns is like this 500 something page history book um, that reads like the most powerful storytelling you've ever read. And that's partly because like nothing is told without its history. Like nothing is told without its context. Everyone is from somewhere, like, and they are from somewhere with people who are from somewhere else. And I think those stories that have that kind of lineage and that context like help so greatly. And I think those are the kinds of things that show up in the narratives around campaigns like the marijuana arrest one, which barely ever talked about marijuana. It was like, everybody does the same thing. And 95% of the people who get picked up for it are black and brown people. Like, what's that about? Um, and so stories that recenter the question when we get to a question that's about criminalization, that recenter it on the system actors, that recenter it on disparities, that recenter it on structural inequities, um, instead of just on like individual um, pain or heroism. And those things matter, um, but they're always most powerful when, when they're set in a bigger context. Thank you. And you, you. I would be remiss if I didn't mention your book until we reckon as well. It's a key book in, <laughs> to mention here as far as changing narratives. Okay, so now I have a question for Cassandra. In places where marijuana has been decriminalized, was there a corresponding dip in the racial disparities, disparities in arrests overall? So this is a multi-layered question because the amount of people of color, the number went down, um, but the racial disparities in the arrest that remain in some states have stayed the same, if not, have, if not, have gone up. And I think that this really reinforces the point that it's not, that marijuana is an excuse, that drugs are an excuse for the state to um, inflict harm on our communities. And that the thing that we need to do is to get rid of the thing that is inflicting the harm. Um, and so that, that marijuana arrests are about policing, drug arrests are about policing and the, our commitment to it. Um, and we can get rid of all the drugs and we will still see racial disparities in law enforcement, um, enforcement. And so it's really important that's why it's really important for us to be really clear um, about what it is that we're fighting for. And I think that inherent in drug, drug policy is a, is a movement about ending policing and state sanctioned violence against people. Exactly, thank you. Um, moving on to the next question that I'm gonna to present to both of you. Um, do you think you run the risk of losing some major reforms by lumping those charged with nonviolent crimes with those charged by violent crimes since decision makers are more likely to change laws policies for those that they see as less of a threat to society? And I know Danielle kind of touched upon this a little bit, but if you, you can both go into it a bit more, that would be great. Okay, Danielle's giving me that look, so I'll go first. So <laughs> um, I think the, the big risk is not doing it. I think we're at this moment where we have to start um, pushing to see how much capital we do have. Um, and that was Danielle's point where we make assumptions and where, you know, this is not 1983, right? This is 2020, there's a lot more information. And I think we need to start finding the elected officials that think the way that we do and start electing the elected officials that think the way that we do so they can introduce those things. I mean, I think that policy is inherently a game of compromise um, and those things might not make it to the end, but I think it's powerful for it to start in the beginning. And then the other thing that I would say is that policy and elected officials are moved by power and so it means that if we can get more people to join the fight when we bring these things together, that when these decision makers are deciding what they're going to trade, that they become afraid to trade, it, trade out our people, right? The more that we claim people as our people, as opposed to those people, um, the more power we have in the room so that it's not a risk and it's not a, an acceptable compromise. Um, and I think that you see that in other campaigns. 
Um, and it's truly important in the day to day that power building and that we're not negotiating against ourselves by creating these arbitrary lines um, is important. And I think what's really important for me to say to drug policy reformers is that it doesn't muddle the issue. I think oftentimes people have this um, idea of this purity test, like we're only talking about drugs. We're only talking about overdose. We're only talking about this. This will confuse it. I was like, do you not think people who commit harm possess drugs? Do you not think people who commit harm are struggling with addiction? Do you not think people are in these positions because of the conditions of the drug war and the conditions of prohibition? These are also our people. And so I think it's, I think that there are risks. I don't think that these things are going to pass tomorrow, but I think we're not gonna know that unless we start trying. People didn't think we could decriminalize all drugs and we did that. If I ask people right now, should we try to decriminalize drugs? Um, right now, people will be like, no one's ready. No one's ready. This is, we can't do it. Let's not do marijuana. Let's do marijuana and then we'll do psychedelics. Then we can do heroin. Well, I'm gonna tell you something. On November 3rd, we decriminalize heroin because that is what we needed because people who use heroin are also our people. Sorry. That just, yeah. no, that was awesome. That's right. And I would just echo too, right? I think like the first thing is, right? Like, how do you assess power? How do you build power? And the question is, right? Like, is it a ballot measure? Is it the legislature? Like to be really specific about why we think something isn't winnable and ask the question of what would make it winnable and what it would take to get there. So to always, even if we're judging something is not winnable, to have in that space a discipline about understanding and always asking what would bring it to within reach instead of sort of accepting that we just don't happen to be there. And then the other part for me is like, we make policy compromise, we exercise narrative discipline. Right? Like we do not have to throw people under the bus and how we talk about why we need to win. And it's the narrative compromise that the drug policy movement has made far more than the policy compromise that has created barriers to the things that would come after. It is the stories that have been told about who people who use drugs aren't. It's the, the it's saying, don't send them to prison. Well, they'll be around all these inherently evil people who will make them worse just through proximity as opposed to saying, don't send them to prison where they will be in, have violence inflicted on them by the state, be separated from their loved ones, be subjected to isolation and pain and all these other things. And so I think that, I think we can develop really rigorous narrative discipline immediately and over time build adequate power that when it comes to the policy compromises, less and less of that is required of us. Great. Thank you. We have one more question for Danielle that I'm going to, we're going to close it out by turning to each of you to give us like the final words and your thoughts about like what we can be doing to like advancing the movement to end, like just concrete things we could be doing. One thing in 2021, what we could be doing to advance the movement to end mass incarceration. So Danielle, this question is for you. Um, isn't it true that restorative justice processes are less likely to work with violent crimes since the victim and or family members are less likely to, to forgive someone who has severely hurt them or killed their loved ones respectively? So at Common Justice, we only work, um, we only do restorative justice for violence. Every single process we've held over the last more than a decade has resulted in agreements. I mean, they have all developed a consensus through the process of repair. 90% of the survivors given the choice choose us. But I think it's really important to note that forgiveness is not a prerequisite for opting for restorative justice. Forgiveness is a deeply personal orientation people make toward, for some people, it's an orientation toward the person who hurt them. For some, it is about their relationship to their own pain. For them, it is a deeply spiritual and sacred thing that is between themselves and their God. And forgiveness does not, it is not required in order to do restorative justice. What is required to do restorative justice is pragmatism. And I should have long known this as a victim myself, like as a survivor myself. Um, and the best way I've been able to describe it is like as survivors, we will feel pain like in the marrow of our bones, like so deep we would like wring out our bones to be free of it. And we will feel fear so all consuming that in the safety of our own homes and the arms of the people we love most, we will be unable to sleep. And when exhaustion finally takes us, we will wake from that sleep with nightmares and we will feel rage so intense, it makes us unrecognizable to ourselves. But at the end of the day, we are pragmatic. And the two things we cannot stand 
or the idea of going through it again, or the idea of someone else going through it. And so it means when we are presented with an option that we think will present those things while we feel loss, while we feel fear, while we rage, we choose that option. And I think it's extraordinarily important that we make room for survivors who are furious. Like survivors, we do not need to lay down our fury to be part of a movement to end mass incarceration. I think about one survivor who summarized this to us early on when he said about the person who hurt him, he said, you know, fuck him, but fuck jail, right? And I think there is a way in which like being able to hold both of that, that he, the person who hurt him had no right to cause the harm he did, that he was mad about it, that part of him wanted to repay that in the form of violence, that that was still where he was in his arc of his healing process. And at the same time, he knew he and others deserved better than jail as a solution because it wouldn't produce anything of value for him. And thank you for everyone's patience with my internet. <laughs> We're glad you came back, thank you. Okay, Cassandra, so I'm gonna um, turn it to you for your final words. And then to the video. Um, I I think one of the biggest mistakes, well, one of the biggest limitations to how we've um, built our movement is the idea that we could win without each other. Um, and I think that what these last four years <laughs> have really reinforced to me is that the state is not working in silos. The state is always one, like one sound, one beat, one band. Like they are just on it. Different people step up at different times and come back, but that is a marching band with, with immaculate precision. Um, and I don't think our movement's like that. And it's not that I want our movement to be like that, but I do want us to have one vision, right? And I think that I'm building an affirmative vision together um, is going to get us so far. And it's why this moment is so exciting around people understanding that abolition is more than just tearing things down. It's about building things and building the world. And you know, oftentimes people are saying, oh, it's time to rebuild, it's time to reinvest, it's time to reimagine. And you know, Rashad Robinson at um, a Color of Change offered to me, let's stop trying to, like, we're not rebuilding anything, we're building stuff. We're not reinvesting, we're investing. We're not reimagining, we are creating a different level of imagination. And I think that that, in order for us to end mass incarceration, I think in order for us to um, and you know bring violence into the space and to actually deal with it and to center survivors um, and to end the drug war for us is like, we need to be building with more people. Um, and Danielle, I think the point that I'm taking from this is that, our, the moms in our movement are not different from the moms in your movement. And what would it look like if the moms built the affirmative vision together? Um, and so I'm really moved by that and really hoping to bring that back to my folks uh, to see how we can make something like that possible. Thank you. Yeah, and I would, I would underscore all of that. Like this is a time to build, right? It is a time to build vision and it is a time to build power and no change comes without some loss. You know, we do a lot at Common Justice like when our participants are like making really positive changes in their lives but come with separation from old habits. We do a lot to honor the fact that even those best changes come with some loss. And the shift that you are talking about, like calling on your movement to do, Cassandra, because in many ways, like what you are doing is you are calling on your movement to step toward ours, right? right. Um, and we are ready, you know, we're ready for you. <laughs> like, we are ready <laughs> for you. Um, and I just would say like the leadership you are providing is like so long needed. It is so long needed and it is so important. And I know that some people will not come with you where you are going and the number of people who will join you and who are waiting for you and who need you are just so far greater than that. And so I think I would say like as an invitation to the drug policy folks in this space to say that like, 
we have tools on our side where like when people ask you about the drug dealers and people ask you about violence associated with drugs where you will not have to cringe and be nervous and worry you're gonna lose. Like we have strategies and a base and talking points and all of those things to like expand your toolbox so that you can win. And like what we need from you is that when like you all like from the base to your leadership like Cassandra see this opportunity and step for it, like step with her um, and we are here for every one of you and we believe that together we will win. Beautiful. That's beautiful. Thank you both so much. Such a powerful discussion. Um, thank you everyone who joined us today and we have our marching orders to build and work together and just create this new vision for what we want. Um, thank you. Enjoy the rest of your evening. Bye-bye. And huge, huge thank you to the Common Justice team for organizing this, convening us, bringing us all together. So D'Angelo, Kira, Aaliyah, and Milse. Yes. Thank you. You made DPA look good, so we really appreciate it. D'Angelo and Milse, thank you. Thank you for the partnership. We really appreciate it. Yeah. Okay. Bye, y'all. Bye.